grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text this morning comes from our gospel reading from Matthew chapter 20. We read the first 16 verses. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. <clears throat> And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. He replied to them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first. And the first, last. So far from God's holy work. <laughs> Dear fellow redeemed, beloved of God, if I were to ask you whether God is loving or unloving, especially those of you who have grown up in church all of your lives, you wouldn't have much of a problem answering that question, would you? Of course God is a loving God. All you would have to do is think about all Jesus has done for each one of us. How he went to the cross to pay that penalty for all of our sins. When we think of that, we understand that God is loving beyond words. So that's an easy one. Of course, God is loving. If I were to ask you whether God is wise or foolish, again, the answer to that question is going to be pretty easy for those of us who know the Bible. All you would have to do is simply look at the creation. Look at how God knit everything together so perfectly that this world would be the perfect place for human beings to live. All you have to do is just look around at everything that you would see, and you know that God is wise. If I were to ask you if God is almighty and powerful, again, for us, that, that question is not a problem at all. Again, we can look at the creation and, see, and know that everything that exists, exists solely by the power of God. God holds everything together. We can look also at the miracles of Jesus as he walked on this earth. And as we look at those miracles, we know that our God, of course, is almighty. He's all power. He's powerful beyond what we could imagine. What if I were to ask you, if God is fair or unfair? How would you answer that question? We might want to answer fair to start off with, but I think the answer to this question is a little more complicated to them than just that. And the parable before us this morning really kind of gets into, in a way, an answer to that question of whether God is fair and un or unfair, and specifically when it has to do with salvation. This parable is told in response to something that Peter says, and that no doubt was on the minds of the disciples back in chapter 19. So we need to take a minute to go back into chapter 19 to give us the context for this parable that Jesus tells this morning. So in Matthew 19, Jesus was confronted by a rich man who wanted to know how he could earn eternal life. He knew all the commandments. He boasted that he had kept them all. But when Jesus tells him in verse 21 of chapter 19 that in order for him to be perfect, that he should sell all that he has and give it to the poor, well, that was just too much 
for this rich young man. He couldn't bear it. And he couldn't bear it because he loved, he loved his possessions more than he loved God. And that's made that clear. In response to this, then, Jesus says to his disciples in chapter 19, verse 23, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. He told them, in fact, that it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we've heard that a lot of times, but imagine hearing that for the first time and what a startling and striking thing that would be. You mean for somebody to be saved, it's no more possible than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle? And so the disciples respond in just the way that we would. Who then can enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus replies with that wonderful assurance, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And so God makes it clear that he is the source of salvation for every single person. But all of this sort of starts to sink in for Peter, as we see at the end of chapter 19, and he replies to all of this in this way. He says, see, we have left all and followed you, therefore what shall we have? You see what Peter must have been thinking, right? Hey, wait a minute. We are the disciples that have been with you from the beginning, right from the very beginning of your earthly, of your earthly ministry. We were there when you taught. We were there when you healed. We were here first. What do we get? What do we get for that, for being here first? They have sacrificed everything to follow Jesus. To that, Jesus simply replies by telling them, I'm giving you eternal life. But then chapter 19 ends with this rather cryptic statement that also ends our parable this morning, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. You see, he knew that Peter and the other disciples were wrestling with this question, will God be fair to me? At least fairness as they defined what fairness was. And so he tells this parable in response to this question that was on the minds of the disciples. So let me ask you this morning, do you ever wonder whether or not God is going to be fair to you? Or does God ever seem to be sort of unfair in your eyes? Do you ever look at him? Do you ever look at the struggles that you're going through in life? Do you ever look at, even though you've been faithful, even though you've gone to church your whole life, even though you spend time studying the scripture, things don't always go well. And have you ever wondered at those times, what is God doing? Why is he not rewarding me for all of this? Why does it seem like those unbelievers who spend their time blaspheming God's name, why does it seem like they have life so easy and I don't? Doesn't that kind of drive us crazy sometimes? What about when we think of the fact then that that unbeliever can spend his whole life as an unbeliever, blaspheming God, but, the, but at the last moment in life, turn to God in faith and be saved, be right next to us in heaven. Doesn't that ever make us wonder if God is fair or not? We think we want God to be fair. We think we want God to do things according to the way that, that we think is fair. Jesus' point of this parable isn't to try to help us see that God really is fair even when it, see, when it doesn't seem that he is. It's, it's not as much about that as it is to help us to actually rejoice in the fact that God, from our perspective anyway, acts in a way that very much seems unfair. And so we, as we look at this parable this morning then, we pray that the Lord would teach us to rejoice in God's unfairness. Because fairness actually means death. But God wants to give us what we do not deserve. So the parable itself is pretty straightforward then. It's, it, it starts with the kingdom of heaven is like. And remember that the kingdom of heaven isn't just a place like we often think of it. It's not just heaven. But when we're talking about the kingdom of God, we're talking about his ruling authority in both heaven and earth. So this parable has to do with how God interacts with his people here. 
The master of the house goes out one morning to find people to work in his vineyard. When he finds some men, he agrees to pay them a denarius, a normal day's wage. The master of the house then goes out again. He goes out the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour. He even goes out at the eleventh hour when there's only one more hour left to work. And he goes out to find more people to work in that vineyard. Now these groups that come later on, they don't agree for a denarius, but they simply agree for whatever is fair, so there's no hint that something unfair is going to happen until we get to verse 8 of our text. And then we read again from verses 8 through 10. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. Now, put yourself in the shoes of those who had worked for 12 hours, who had dealt with the scorching heat of the sun on them. How would you react? Well, let me tell you how I would react. That's not fair. You have got to be kidding me. You mean even those lazy people over there who work just one hour are going to get the same thing as me? Who worked 11 hours longer? I can't believe it. That's how we naturally think about it, isn't it? At first glance, it really does not seem fair at all. But let's not forget that these workers who worked for the whole 12 hours were also saved from unemployment. Had the master not hired them in the first place, they would have gotten nothing. And then the master reminds them in verses 13 through 15 of our text, but he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? That really is the issue, isn't it? Those workers begrudged the generosity of the landowner. It was evil in their sight what this landowner had done. And so they grumbled because they envied those who had worked less time. They didn't think that those who worked less deserved to have the same grace. So do we ever feel like that about others? Now, I've never known a Christian who actually hoped that another human being would go to hell. I've never known a Christian who thought that someone else shouldn't hear God's word simply based on, on what they had done. I don't think I've ever heard of actually someone thinking that they were somehow worth more to God than others. What are you doing? But I've seen these things in the attitudes around me. I've seen people talk about people who have a sin that seems just too difficult for God to forgive. I've heard the whispers of, of someone talking about a fellow Christian who, who has fallen into sin. Those whispers of, they still call themselves a Christian? And I've seen how my own heart does this too. I've seen how my own heart doesn't take my own sin as seriously as maybe the sins of somebody else. I've seen those times when my own feeling of my own righteousness, I, I feel like I shine somehow a little brighter than everybody else. That proud little Pharisee within me shudders at the thought of God looking at someone who would waste away their life on drugs or alcohol or blaspheming God or whatever, and to think that God would love that person just as much as they love me. I mean, I'm ordained. I've got it better, right? Have you ever found yourself saying, God, you're going to treat them the same way that you treat me? The sinful nature has this idea that this way of operating by God is not fair. And that we think that God should be fair. Our sinful nature wants God to be fair, or at least what we think fairness ought to be. Our sinful nature wants to think that we deserve more from God 
than weaker Christians. That we deserve more from God because we've been Christians longer. Or because we've had to give up more to live the faith. Or because we've faced more persecution, maybe, than others. And we don't seem to have better lives than the people around us. We start to grumble against God. We start to become envious of His grace. And in our grumbling, we cry out to God, Just be fair to me. Give me what I deserve. And what do you think you deserve? What would God give us if he was being fair? He would give us eternal death in hell. Each one of us. That's what we all deserve. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. Remember again, those 12-hour workers were just as unemployed at the beginning of the day as those one-hour workers. Remember that you and I were born as sinners just as everybody else was. You and I were born as enemies of God, just like everybody else. And just like everybody else by nature, we deserve His wrath and punishment. If we ask God for the wages that we deserve, we would receive death. Fairness leads to death. But God in His grace wants to give us what we don't deserve. Salvation and eternal life in heaven with Him. And He gives this to us because of the unfairness that He showed to His own Son. Jesus is God's only true and faithful worker in the vineyard, and yet He cast Him out. On the cross, Jesus suffered that punishment that each one of us has deserved. He died that death that we should have died. But Jesus willingly went to the cross for our sins. He willingly went to death so that God could give us what we don't deserve. So that God could be gracious to every one of us. Jesus lived and died for us so that we would be able to enjoy his victory over the grave forever. Jesus did it all so that God could come with us Come to us with his word and sacrament and bring us into the kingdom of his grace. God indeed is a very generous landowner. He has brought you into his vineyard. And if someone then in God's vineyard, like we are, since God has brought us in, that grace of God is ours to share. So as we speak to those who are maybe friends or co-workers or family members who have fallen into, spin, into sinful lives, we speak to those as, as we speak to those who have never known about God's love for them. People who we might never expect to be sitting in the pew next to us, we can give them that wonderful message of God's grace, that same message that has brought us in. Jesus has washed away all of the sins of everybody. And so that's our job as workers in the vineyard, to bring others in as well. Because we're just the same as them, people who have been forgiven by the Son. But you know, this parable doesn't just change the way that we look at others either. It helps us to rejoice in how God sees us. Jesus says again in that cryptic line right at the end of our text, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. And this is not bad news at all. This is very good news for us. It's not bad news because how often do we, when we are crushed down by our sins, actually feel just the opposite of those 12-hour workers? We feel ourselves like we are just those one-hour workers. People who haven't always spent our lives loving and serving our Savior. People who have let time for God's word be bumped away by, by TV or other forms of entertainment or just simply a chance to sleep in on Sunday. People whose offerings get bumped down when the cable bill or gas prices go up. People who are slow to share God's grace for friends who need it. And what does God give you? Not the punishment and damnation that we all deserve. But he gives each one of us his son, who washes away every one of those sins. And he gives us a home in heaven. A landowner called many different people to work in his vineyard, and at the end of the day, he gave them exactly what he had promised. Nice work. Dear Christians, the evening is coming, and this world is drawing to an end, and we will all stand before our Savior. And do you know what he'll say to you? 
when you hold on to his grace, when you know him as the Lord who, deny, who, who delights to give forgiveness to sinners, who calls the last first as this king in this upside down kingdom, a kingdom that seems to us unfair, he will simply say to us, come. Come into this kingdom prepared by my heavenly father. It's what I have promised to you. Yes, even to you sinners who hear my gracious call. It might not seem fair to our human ears, but it's the grace and the love of God who calls us. So may we always rejoice in God's unfairness. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.